What's up, everybody? I am your host, Chris Hampton. Welcome to episode six of the Power Company podcast, brought to you by PowerCompanyClimbing.com. I have uh, gotten some messages recently, a few of them, from people asking if I'm going to be putting out more podcasts more frequently, and uh, the answer is probably not. Maybe. Um, I've been toying with the idea of doing some rants uh, just about the... uh, things I see around the climbing industry that uh, specifically about training that I don't agree with and maybe I'll drink a couple of beers and then I'll rant. We'll see. Is that a good business decision? I have no idea. Uh, However, uh, I am going to keep doing these things because you guys seem to like them and uh, I I also don't do the Skype interview thing. I, I would rather sit down with someone and have a conversation. I think there's a certain quality to that that I really appreciate and and frankly I'm doing these because I want to talk to people and I want to learn um, you guys just get to learn as well so I'd do them even if there wasn't a microphone and I, I'm not going to do that over Skype because uh, that kind of sucks okay uh, you can however support the podcast uh, I'm not asking for money I'm not asking for donations but you guys have been great. Everybody is buying the ebooks and they're loving them. And if you just keep doing that, buy them for a friend, buy them as a gift, buy them for yourself. Uh, you keep doing that. We'll keep doing these things. Also, if you're uh, if you're in near anywhere where we're having workshops, stop in and uh, and check us out. Talk to us. Learn from us. Let us learn from you. Um, we've got some coming up in Akron, Ohio. If you happen to be in the Akron area. And I believe those are May 10th and 11th. Let me look here. Yeah, May 10th and 11th in Akron, Ohio at the uh, Rock Mill Climbing Gym. So if you happen to be around Akron, uh, stop in and see us. Uh, Also, we just got back from a couple of workshops. Nate and I did. Uh, We were down in Knoxville, Tennessee at Onsite Climbing Gym and had a great time. Uh, Several people came out for the workshops. Um... It was great. I think they got a lot out of it, and uh, and honestly, I think we got a lot out of it. Uh, it's good practice for us, and uh, we just like to hang out with people and talk to people about their climbing. So, like I said, come out and see us at the next workshop, wherever we're near you. While I was in Knoxville, I did get to spend a day outside at the Obed, which is amazing and definitely an, uh, an unheralded gym in the climbing community. So if you... If you happen to be in the Tennessee area, don't just get sucked into Chattanooga. The Obed is pretty badass. And I got out with my friend Yasmin and Rick, and we had a great time. I got fed beta, spoon-fed beta, and was able to flash one of the coveted 13As in the canyon, uh, which I'm pretty psyched about because I'm feeling pretty good about my climbing right now. Uh, Even though I haven't trained for routes, at all. I've done absolutely zero endurance work. No endurance, no power endurance, nothing. I've climbed routes maybe uh, four or five days, uh, but I'm feeling good about it. And I'm headed to Vegas tomorrow to Red Rocks for a week. So uh, just to try and get my feet up off the ground a little higher, get my feet back into that arena. Yeah. Uh, Episode six, Steve Bechtel. We're bringing him back. I know you guys love him. I love him too. We're going to talk about uh, running. Should you run or shouldn't you run? We also get into CrossFit a little bit. Um, Steve echoes my sentiments here. We, we share the same ideas, and he knows quite a bit more about it than I do, and I appreciate his uh, the way he approaches these things. So um, if you don't know much about Steve, I'm not going to tell you all about Steve. If you don't know much about him, uh, go back to episode two. Uh, You can also hear Steve a couple of times on Training Beta. Um, You can learn all about him there and on Episode 2 here. So we're just going to jump right into this thing with Steve Bechtel, To Run or Not to Run. Oh, and one more thing. 
uh, just like in the first interview with Steve and in the next one that you'll hear, uh, the sound quality was compromised by the fluorescent lights in Steve's office, and I had no idea that was going to happen. I've been a studio rat when it comes to audio, so I didn't know those fluorescent lights were going to fuck with me. So, excuse that. I've done all the magic I could do to pull that sound out of there, short of working for hours and hours and hours. Uh, so yeah, deal with it. All right, on to Steve. Maybe don't know. Here's the deal. We have a limited amount of adaptation potential. And how hard you push in all of these different directions limits how much you can push in, in other directions. This time to build. definitely bettering yourself yeah and i think that's and that's honestly important. like you don't spend that much quality time with people in right. your day-to-day life most people don't get to <clears throat> and but you know you go out climbing with somebody you're with them for like seven hours and yeah all you get to do is like try hard and talk and those are two really great things and you know after a while you look back and you're like gosh you know the best times of my life are with those five guys you know yeah and you know what the conversations when you're not at the crag, you're always about climbing. But yeah. when you're at the crag, you're not talking about climbing necessarily. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> okay, so talking about climbing. Um, I was just downstairs talking with Inga Perkins, who I work with um, some online. And um, she's, she's, as well as being a rock climber, she's also, and you know, she loves being in the Alpine. She loves skiing. She loves these mountain traverses that she does. She's basically a machine. And one of her questions when we first started working together was, do I have to give up cardio? You know, because she really loves to run. She loves to ski. And for me, I very rarely uh, prescribe cardio to anyone unless they're a really base level athlete um, but for the people who really love it and and get a lot out of it just mentally or emotionally or you know their life feels better when they're running or doing cardio I just say go for it you know as long as it's not impacting your you reaching your goals climbing wise then I don't see any problem in doing it um, but there's a big argument around cardio right now and around the importance of running and and is it the best weight loss method or you know it's just a big argument so yeah i've um i get a i get a lot of questions about it because i i famously said that um you know running was as important for climbing as As climbing climbing is is for running. running yeah and and Here's the deal. We have a limited amount of adaptation potential. And how hard you push in all of these different directions limits how much you can push in in other directions. And so we talked about it when you and I had our conversation about resistance training. Um, If you are going to town on a bodybuilding program in the gym, it's going to limit how hard you can climb outside Mm -hmm. um mountain biking skiing um ice climbing any of that stuff is going to take away from the energy that you can put into into serious rock climbing now that being said um developing a base level of cardiovascular fitness um is is important for recovery purposes because all of our recovery is cardiovascular um, but you don't have to be um, super uh, dialed in on training for running. You don't have to be doing intervals and hills um, in order to develop that cardiovascular capacity. Um, what's interesting, like on a long enduro pitch, um, I'll be sweating like crazy and breathing hard. And, um, you know, you've got that. You can feel the the lactate in your lungs, you know, the, the, um, the copper breath. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll go, gosh, I felt that way running before. So therefore running is a good 
good training for that. Right. And so we can look at that as a systemically um, similar adaptation, but it isn't the same thing. And and what's really important to understand is that aerobic adaptations are very motor specific. Um, and so just because you've got a big engine uh, for one sport, like a, say you're a really great cyclist, right. it doesn't, doesn't automatically mean you're going to perform right. well in another one. Right. And we saw that with Lance Armstrong when he was right. in his prime. Yeah. You know, he tried to move to marathon running and wasn't, yeah. wasn't great at it. Yeah. And, and he did okay. Yeah. Um, because this, but, and that's really interesting because cycling and running are, are linear, extremely similar. cyclic yeah. sports. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, I've been talking with Mark Twight a little bit and he's, um, getting more and more interested in rock climbing and he's like, holy cow, this sport is so tough. And here's mm. the guy that was like one of the best ice climbers and alpinists right. in the world. And, and he's like, super tough guy. This is, this is way different. Yeah. And, um, and so it, it is, it has to be super specific and you've even seen it coming from the red to, to climbing on the limestone. It oh yeah. A, you know, definitely. Yeah. Different when I'm, game. When I'm at this altitude, the, you know, long pitches at the red, I'm not winded at all. I can climb a 30 foot pitch here, do 15 moves and be out of breath, completely yeah. winded. Yeah. And I noticed this morning, actually, I was getting acupuncture and normally when I'm in town, I'm running and I don't get to focus on me and just my breathing and I don't slow down much because I'm so busy when I'm here. But when I was getting acupuncture this morning, I was laying there and really focusing on my breathing and realizing how difficult it is for me to breathe at this altitude. Just coming from being a flatlander to coming yeah. up here. Is cardio training something you think would benefit that? Or is it just something I need to adapt to? Yeah, well, that's, that's a fascinating thing. Uh, the adaptation to altitude... Um, Randy Wilbur wrote a great book uh, a few years ago on on high altitude training for athletes. Okay. And we, what's it's really interesting because it's counterintuitive. We used to think like if I go up and I run in the mountains, right. like if we go run at Wild Iris, it's at nine thousand feet. Right. Um, I'm right. going to get more bang for my buck. You come down and you're going to be silly strong. Right. But what happens is the adaptations um, are. Uh, happen over time and so if you're here for a couple of weeks you're going to adapt to the altitude and you're going to be good right um and so what they're doing now is they're having athletes sleep high and train low and so the olympic okay. athletes will um they'll have them sleeping high outside of colorado springs at nine or ten thousand feet come back down to colorado springs which is still high altitude but do their training because the oxygen density is higher and they get more intensity out of their training. Gotcha. Then they go back up high and recover in the thin air and they see better adaptation that way. Mm, if we do it the other way and we sleep down here and then we go run up at Wild Iris, um, our intensity or the difficulty with which we can actually perform right, that is down. limited right. by our oxygen uptake. And right. so so it's the opposite of, of um, what you would think intuitively um but uh the number one factor to adapting to altitude is time is spending the time in that area yeah. and and so um really like the more time you spend camping out up up top um the faster you're going to adapt so right, you, and usually right. it's a couple weeks yeah um and and so and we've kind of learned that in on in alpinism and in the mountains um that um you know, time spent up there is difficult. And so that's why we climb high and sleep low. Right. Um, but ultimately, if you're training, if you're there to train, you do it the opposite. You like sleep up at camp four and then run laps on the ridge below you. Yeah, makes total sense. Do you think there's a base level of cardio that a climber, of cardiovascular fitness that a climber needs? There, There and is. And is there a way to measure that? Can yeah. you... Yeah, it's real individual, and you can go and get your VO2 max tested and right. stuff, or your your anaerobic threshold, all those sorts of things. But honestly, um, I think if you're if you're capable of running about, but let's say half hour, you know, nice steady state 
pace, um, you've probably got enough for recovery from anaerobic bursts. Because really climbing is is sprints of anaerobic. Right. Um, uh, Followed with, by a recovery. Yeah, period. recovery, yeah. whether it's at a jug or back <clears throat> on the ground. Right. Um, and so, and I don't think there's any harm in doing a little bit of running, but I think things like the, these self-limiting modes of running, whether it's like only nasal breathing or running in minimalist shoes or things like that, um, they're great and that's probably a fine recovery mode but but when you get to a point that you're like training for this race and you're also trying to climb hard that's when we start to see the the split in your ability to adapt sure and anybody that thinks that they can um perform very well at two different sports is not performing as high as they could in either one of those sports right right so bo jackson could have been amazing even more than he was at one of those sports and, right and you can't use that outlier as the example and, right and that's and, that's a hard thing you know uh, one of my my good friends ty mack is a is a fabulous rock climber he can climb 514 he's free del cap um and he's also a fabulous fabulous runner right. but he you know he's not you know if he's trying to do both of those sports again he's not as as um, able to perform as he might be if he was focusing specifically on one thing. Sure. Now, I know the Anderson brothers uh, cite some reasons why they think cardio uh, shouldn't be included in climbing training programs. You know, things like it makes you hungrier. Um, and I don't know if they've made the leg mass argument, though I, I feel like I heard them make that argument. And, and I don't necessarily disagree with their arguments at all. I'm just curious as to what your take on, um, A, is it, can it be detrimental to a climbing training program if, say, you aren't running enough that it impacts your training necessarily, but can running at all be detrimental to climbing? Yeah, so... The, the general thing is my, Mike and Mark both have a great background as mm -hmm. competitive runners. Right. Um, and they're, they both did very well with that. They've both, um, been successful with recreational cycling. Um, and so you look at these guys and you go, okay, they have a substantial, um, aerobic base. Right. They already um, have the engine there. Yeah. Yeah. And, but but the main argument is the intensity of it is too high. Um, and I'll give you an example. On a rest day, Mike will often go on long hikes, like three and four hour hikes, um, which is low intensity cardiovascular training. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. it's not detrimental to his performance. And so I think that's one of the things like uh, they're just saying that unless it's unless it's dead easy, you shouldn't be doing it. Gotcha. Um, and, and there are some times that you you want to develop um, your aerobic um, or anaerobic capacity and people automatically will turn to running. Um, and so there are two things we should talk about with running is like, like you were saying, weight loss um, and then developing aerobic capacity. And so <clears throat> talking about weight loss first, um, I don't think that you're gonna gain a lot of leg mass um, unless you're doing a, a major running program. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that's sort of neither here nor there, and it's probably more driven by nutrition. Um, but for, for weight loss and fat loss, there is nothing like controlling your intake. Like you will never out, tra sure. out train your diet. Right. And so you can, you know, if you've got some non-negotiables in, in, what you take in, like I love to have yogurt for breakfast or I always have a beer at the end of the day. That's where you're going to be knocking yourself out. It's not whether you're, you're running, you know, half hour or six, you know, 60 minutes a day. Um, average person will burn around a hundred calories a mile, whether they're running or walking, um, it, you know, as a matter of physics. Um, and there's, you know, there's an adjustment for how much you weigh and whatnot, but, if you and I go out for a half hour run, um, you know, we're going to cover three, four miles, right? 
um, that's three or 400 calories. You'd cover three or four miles. Yeah. <laughs> I'd get about a yeah. half a mile. Let's see, half hour, <laughs> half hour, that's six miles. No, uh, <laughs> if I'm out here, I might not make yeah. it to a quarter mile. Yeah, but so say, say we run three miles, we both burn 300 calories. Yep. Um, the, the adaptation or the, the, uh, the um, load of that training session costs you so much more than cutting three tablespoons of peanut butter out of your diet. Sure. Um, yeah. And, and so that's where, where the argument starts to fall apart. Okay. Um, so we want to train for aerobic capacity and our ability to recover, but we want to do it in specific ways. And more so when efficient we, ways. Right. right. So when we look at specificity, we have motor spe specific things and we have metabolic specific things. Mm -hmm. And so when we um, are trying to train as ultimately or as specifically as possible, we want to line up both of those things. So when I'm training for aerobic capacity in, in climbing, I should be doing things that involve the same muscle groups as climbing and at the intensity with which I'm going to be using those uh, muscle groups. And that's where um, the um, arc training, arcs, things like that. Yeah, right? extensive endurance style stuff comes into play. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, like climbing up and down on the climbing wall is, is more boring than trail running but at the same intensity or same heart rate zone um, we're going to be seeing the proper adaptations mitochondria capillarization all those sorts of things that are that are needed by rock climbers and so that's where we want to be um, specifically developing in those capacities so if you let's go back to weight loss for just a minute um, if you burn 100 calories per mile, roughly, running, uh, how many calories do you burn per roughly the same amount of time? Let's say it takes you seven, eight minutes to run a mile if you're you know, going at a pretty good pace. How many calories do you burn in eight minutes of resistance training? Um, you would burn probably a little bit less. Okay. But there's an interesting thing there, and um, the easiest way to look at it is called an afterburn effect, mm -hmm. and and it's this elevation in metabolism that comes with intense exercise. So if you and I go out and we go nice, easy, steady pace run for three miles, we burn 300 calories. Um, our metabolism, our base metabolism, will return to um, normal levels very very quickly quickly right um our heart rates drop back mm -hmm. down we recover and mm -hmm. we've burned mostly uh aerobic metabolism we burn mostly fat during that time mm -hmm. um but if you and i go down and we do a bunch of circuits and and you know say we do some kettlebell complexes or some sprints or or any of these sort of high intensity conditioning things we'll um we'll maybe burn the same number of calories in in Oh, you know, hour workout, but um, we'll still have a what's called this afterburn effect, where the metabolism takes longer to slow down afterward, and so you're still burning extra calories as as the hours tick by as you recover. Gotcha. And so that's <clears throat> where weight loss, be, um, or excuse me, weight training becomes a, a superior tool for for fat loss. For rock climbers, though the problem becomes a matter of recovery. And this right. is my argument against, against group training, against going high intensity in the weight room too often, mm -hmm. is you know, 36, 48 hours to recover. You've only got a few sessions like that a week. And then where do we fit the climbing in? Right. And so that's why I think yeah. again, like um, interval climbing, um, climbing combined with strength training, um, uh, even our low intensity arc style training, that's where we're still going to see superior results would be to add more, more volume in those specific realms. Um, or to do something that's, you know, like you're, you're on the right path. Um, things that start to have motor patterns that are similar. So if I, if right. I'm doing total body weight training, that's more like climbing than running is. Right. It's not, it's not the same, but we're, we're ticking, ticking that direction. Now I've always, sort of in, along the same lines there, I've always told um, my climbers who want to lose weight at the same time as they're trying to work through a climbing training program, um, they often just make the logical connection between running is a good way to lose weight, so 
doing high volume climbing should be the more the superior way to lose weight and I try to get them to do more hard bouldering and things like that what are your thoughts in that realm I think I think you're right um, and and it's interesting because like the 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 whole idea of steady state cardiovascular um, as a superior fat loss tool is I mean yeah it's exercise but if you've watched the finish line of a marathon i mean there are fat people coming across that line all the time right and if <clears throat> if running was doing the trick that would have done it um and and it is you know high volume climbing is nice you burn a lot of calories and things like that but i think um the high intensity of bouldering like boom you're on the wall for 15 seconds right. and it takes you five minutes for your uh, metabolism mm -hmm. to drop again or your heart rate and there's some interesting things where people have worn heart rate monitors for these different sessions and over time the heart rate during a bouldering session will have a higher average than it will for like an arc session you know your arc you get your heart rate up to 125 and you keep it there for an hour right um bouldering it's going to like 170 Spikes and drops and 170 yeah. drops um mm. and and that sort of up down up down has mm. that a superior metabolic effect of course really a combination of the things is probably the most effective but again it it's all about i mean the whole game is is controlling what goes in your mouth sure absolutely um, and so then we come to this which thing. is what i'm terrible at yeah right <laughs> yeah so you come to this thing how do i how do i train hard and lose weight right and this you know we make fun of bodybuilders because you know it's kind of a silly sport or if it's an activity or whatever right but those guys know how to get lean like yeah. way more than anybody else and we can we can snicker at them or whatever mm -hmm. but you when they start talking about fat loss man i'm listening and and so what what they'll tend to do will be to you know build up and shred um and so when when we're trying to lose weight needs to be when we're not trying to perform our best right that's what i was going to ask the yeah. bodybuilders version of losing weight do you think they could do that while simultaneously performing at a sport you know i i think the general idea is they get to be weak as a kitten as they get really really lean right right and and we've seen that with climbers like they they get too lean and then they'll either get injured or mm -hmm. sick or they they just start to tank and they aren't performing and so what we really want to do is to try to bring that weight down um during a base phase right. um, prior to yeah if you're yeah. doing like a, an endurance phase or whatever um but when you start having to really up the power when you're really trying to red point it it becomes pretty challenging and the most important thing is to not get too far away from it if you're if you have more than a five to ten pound fluctuation seasonally we're, we're, you're probably letting it go a little bit too much off season sure um and uh and and then that sort of leads us into like how lean is too lean yeah and so then you you just always have to be looking at your performance parameters and saying like can i you know can i still hit these basic values you know how many pull-ups can i do <clears throat> when i'm fat how many pull-ups can i do when i'm my skinniest and if you start to get lean 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 and you start to have those those uh, strength to weight ratio things start to drop then you know you're overdoing it yep that's that's a good good way to look at it i i had a girl just yesterday say oh, i'm feeling way stronger but i'm feeling like i need to lean down some more you know and i'm like well how about we just keep going where we're at for a little while and see what happens you yeah. know because if you're feeling stronger you're you're reaching your goals yeah you know you don't necessarily have to be lean to reach your goals so right well yeah. and and i think there was a in the 90s there was a huge amount yeah. of like trying to stay super yeah. skinny it seemed like it was else. more of a problem back yeah then. and and i think that we're we're seeing people understand that that you know regular training um keeping very very strong and powerful um makes up for a lot of that you know drop weight um right during season and you know if you're trying to lean down for a red point great you know losing um couple kilograms isn't going to be a big deal but um but i think honestly 
<clears throat> we want to try to find a good weight, a good weight where we continue to get stronger as we're as we're building through the power and strength phases of a training program. Um, and then if you need to cut back a pound or two, great. But yep. um, but trying to make these huge drops in, in weight tends to be counterproductive, especially for female athletes. They have they have a lot more health concerns with with fat loss than males do. Yeah, for sure. And I've convinced myself that's why I can keep cupcakes in my diet. Yeah. Because when I am trying to sin, then I have something I can easily take out. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah, and and I think that that's an interesting thing is like to if you're always super disciplined on your on your eating. Um, there's there's no room for improvement there, and, right. and uh, you know, all joking aside, like there's got to be a time of the year that you you let your feet off the gas, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know maybe it is training a little less, or maybe it is allowing a few of these other things into your diet. Um, but but we do see a lot of problems with people like making a big chronic mistake and then trying to make it up with harder training, like. Right. adding running in or you know doing a zumba class after after a climbing day and right and really it needs to it needs to happen on the yeah. intake yeah and they're just getting more tired when they try to do right more training and and i think then we can start looking at your macronutrient profiles and you can say like we don't need to necessarily limit the amount of calories that are coming in but we got to make sure we're getting enough they're of the right calories, stuff right yeah you know what's what's your what's your uh, some people are, are real tolerant of lower carbohydrate diets, um, kind of across the board. Um, athletes will do better with more protein in their diet. Mm -hmm. I've never run into any rock climber that that was pushing the outside bounds of how much protein that they could bring in. Right. Um, and uh, and that tends to be more satisfying. A higher protein diet makes you feel fuller than a, than a higher carbohydrate diet. Gotcha. I wish pasta was made of protein uh, yeah but it's not uh you said something a few minutes ago uh that that i want to get back to when you mentioned group training and uh hit style training and crossfit style training and you uh you said something a while ago uh, i believe in an article that if crossfit makes you better at climbing then you probably suck at climbing mm -hmm. and i'm of the exact same uh, thought yeah and where i don't think that crossfit or group training is necessarily just a bad thing inherently but i think it's become this this culture of destroying yourself in the gym and that's where i think people are going wrong but i'm interested in hearing your take on it as it relates to rock climbing because people really do love group training and getting worked yeah so yeah, well, and we've talked about this before. Um, training or, or let's say fitness is a result of what you did, not how it felt. And so if you come in um, and pull some heavy weight off the floor and you do some mobility and you walk out of here and you didn't puke, um, I'm really psyched because you may have improved your strength as an athlete. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at CrossFit, we're like, okay, you know, it's high intensity. You do some, you know, you do see some athletes getting pretty strong, but, but really the adaptation arc on that is, is fairly low. After about six weeks, most people adapt out to metabolic training. And so if we look at um, the adaptation persistence of different facets of training like strength versus hypertrophy versus uh, anaerobic training um, we can start to look at this what they call heterochronicity which means how long it takes for you to adapt to a given um, stimulus so to look at adaptation persistence you say okay hypertrophy if i get my muscles nice and big it takes a long long time to do it um, and it takes a long long time to lose it and you've seen mm -hmm. that with people that get big legs and then they're like, how do right. I make them smaller? You can't get rid of them. So that's a persistent factor. Strength, as you know, is a persistent factor because it takes you forever to build up that strength to be able right. to hang a small edge or to do a heavy bench press or whatever. Mm -hmm. But again, that stays with you for a long time. You can stop strength training for a year and still be a fairly strong person. Mm -hmm. Okay. So on the other end of that is anaerobic 
conditioning, right. which is very, very fast to increase yep. to a high level. And goes away quick. But it goes away very, very quickly. And so mm-hmm. when you have a, a workout program that's based around anaerobic conditioning, uh, with with sprinkling in of strength and other sorts of things, um, you you can adapt up to it, but then you, you mm-hmm. hit a hard plateau and you'll hang out there for a long time. And, and typically people will... Um, will get really good results at first and then they stay because of because of the enjoyment or because of the group um and so when i say that um crossfit is isn't great for climbing i mean like anytime you're reading an article about the benefits of crossfit for a sport just take crossfit out of it and replace the word with zumba and see if you're still interested in doing it you know everybody's gonna be like no zumba's not my not my gig Mm -hmm. crossfit's cool zumba's not well, it's the same thing. It's non-specific training. It'd be like, um, you know, lots of people are like, oh yeah, you should do yoga to become better at climbing. I was like, no, I mean, you're not gonna get better at climbing from doing yoga. Right. Yoga can support climbing in a lot of ways, right. um, but it's not, it's not the replacement. And the same thing goes for CrossFit, where you know, the more general, hard, intense stuff you do, the less you're able to do um, on this highly technical, highly intense sport that you're trying to perform at. Yeah, I agree completely. You made a great analogy uh, the other day when we were talking that CrossFit works on the same principles as Justin Bieber. Right. Uh, that it's really popular, but that doesn't mean it's good. Yeah, you know? and and that's the thing. It's like, it's, yeah, you can get generally fit and people, people. I mean, those guys that compete in CrossFit are, are unbelievably yeah. fit guys. But here's the, the crazy thing. The people that perform well in CrossFit competitions don't train by doing CrossFit. You know, they train they the way an athlete trains. Train and right. They do strength. Right. They, they have a very organized program. It's not random. It's not designed to um, hit the, you know, Greg Glassman's 10 facets of fitness. Um, and so, you know, I don't like to, you know, say like it's <clears throat> wrong, but if you want to climb hard, it's wrong. Yeah. And I think people get blinded by that, by the fitness you see in CrossFit. You know, you see those people, they're super strong. They're obviously athletes. Uh, they move really well. Um, and I think people get blinded by that and they just believe, oh, I need to be that so that I can climb well because that's what an athlete looks like and that's how they got there. You know, they did CrossFit and they became an athlete. Yeah. And I think people get blinded. Well, and that's the thing is like trying to be good at, at several things. Um, and, and it, it, you know, it's sort of like we talked at the beginning. I, you know, if you want to be a champion runner, run. If you want to be a champion climber, you climb. But you're mm-hmm. not going to probably be able to do both of those things. Um, you you look at um, you look at the way that general fitness is presented, and it's seen as a really good thing. And one of the things that that the tagline of, of CrossFit is specialization is for insects. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not. It's for human beings. And right. it's, you know, and you, as indicated by the number of people that are successful doctor, lawyer, accountant combos. Sure. You know, like you don't do lots and lots of things. Right. And the other thing is the, with the random nature of the training, training, uh, I, get, I get worked up about training because people think that anytime that they're getting tired or sweaty, it's training, but training is extremely, extremely organized. Right. And so randomized Mm -hmm. training um, doesn't bring the results that systemized training does. And I'll give you an example. Um, You know, you go to college and you get all these textbooks and you have to read those textbooks and study for the classes. Well, imagine we take all the textbooks and we tear the pages out of these books we throw them all over the room and then you just randomly mm-hmm. read one page at a time at, based on what you pick up off the floor are you going to come out of college with the same understanding as if you had done it in an organized fashion reading like page one page two page three you know and, and you know of course not and that's the same sort of thing that happens when you throw random stuff into your um, into your training and a lot of people mistake variability for random and variability we know is important random is not important yeah I felt that way about the I feel that way about all the videos I see online I get worked up 
when someone says, you know, this is how I train and, and it's a workout video. It's mm-hmm. not a, has, it, there's nothing to do with training in there necessarily other than this might be one of the components of their training. Yeah. And I felt that way about the, the Gimme Craft book. While it's a great book of workouts, it's not a training book. And, and it bothered me. And, and maybe that's just me, you know, worrying about semantics that, that it was called a training book. And they do say in, in the beginning of the book, I believe that it, you know, we're not trying to lay out your training program for you. And it, it has a lot of great exercises and, and good workouts, but, but there really is no training in the book. Right. And I thought, I thought that was really a disappointment too, because they're clearly have a fabulous facility and really know what they're doing. Yeah. And, and maybe that's, that's coming down the pipe. Like there's, they're going to come out with the the magna opus of of training climbing. But, but I think, I think that's an interesting thing is that people do get confused about, um, about Mm. what to do, you know, training program to training program. And honestly, like, like we we've talked before, um, the most basic one, the most simple progressive training program is is invariably the best. Um, and then once that stops working, then you complicate it. Um, but uh, but you know it's it it's easy to start start getting too much information um, coming in, and you know mm. gosh, there's you know there's a new training program, you know every two weeks on the yeah. internet now yeah. and and gosh you can you can easily get worked up and go like oh man i'm gonna start doing um you know these style of intervals and i'm gonna mm. buy this hangboard and i'm gonna get some of those um you know the atomic bombs and start training on those and all of those things are valid but within a systemized program to where you're actually going to see um progress from them uh otherwise if you only do something like say you do uh you know a workout on the atomic bombs like killer workout for an hour you know once every six weeks um that's seen more as a traumatic event by your body than something to adapt to right and so the the, all those things need to be carefully placed into your program right i think we're on the same page here as far as you know the cardiovascular fitness aspect of climbing goes i want to give you a couple of um, a couple of examples, a couple of instances, and I just want to see what, how you would suggest those people, um, what, where they go with their training. And so I have a friend who, uh, he's a good climber. He does tend to, uh, gain some weight when he, when we're in the off season and he's very disciplined about getting back to completely shredded and ripped and at his fighting weight, which is, you know, 20, 20, 25 pounds less than what he's at in the middle of the winter. Uh, And he does that largely by being very strict about his diet and quite a bit of running. And I'm curious what you would say about the running portion of it. Would it be advantageous for him to do something else? Do you think it's maybe he's never done only the diet and not running? Um, so maybe it's far more diet than than running that's ha- that's causing that adaptation. I'm just curious what your thought on it is. Well, um, you know they they asked a bunch of strength coaches um, what you know what they would do if they could only work out for 45 minutes. Like you have 45 mm-hmm. minutes a week to work out. Yep. And Josh Hillis, who has a great book called Fat Loss Happens on Monday, he said, I would go shopping. You know, that's the 45 minutes would be all about the food. Mm. And and this guy is the fat loss guy. Like if you want to get skinny, like this book is killer. And it's all about building good habits and, and making sure that those habits stick. And so somebody that's got a 25 pound weight fluctuation, losing weight is a, is a massive stress on your body. Yeah. And so when he's taking time and using energy to lose those 25 pounds, he's taking away from potential um, high intensity training time that he could be putting into the sport. And like I said, if it's more than five to 10 pound fluctuation, um, it probably needs to be controlled mm-hmm. nutritionally. 
Um, running, I'm sure, helps when he gets that much uh, weight on. But again, we're taking away from where we want to be pushing that adaptation. Um, and especially if he's been climbing for very long, yeah. you know, that the window of opportunity, it's smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. And you have to fight so much harder for each grade that, that silly things like losing a little bit of fat, it's a, it's a huge waste of a, of a big chunk of your time. And, and so I think maybe a, a little higher um, wintertime activity for the guy. Um, try not to let the weight go quite so far, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and see if you can see if you can mitigate it with a, a little bit more climbing training. Uh, I know not everybody gets to do that, but it sure. might help. Now, what about if a person comes to you who they love running? That's you know that's kind of their rest day activity. It's their relaxation activity. They just love to do it but they also want to improve their climbing. Um, they're a fairly well-rounded climber, female, let's say. Uh, would you suggest that they stop running or cut back on the running? And if they, if they do continue to run, would it be more beneficial for them to do long, steady state runs or something like interval running or running sprints, things like that? Um, well, here's a funny thing. The, the word priority comes from the Latin root, the first thing. Mm -hmm. And sometime in you know, maybe the last 50 years, we pluralized that and have, have become priorities. Um, but really, you can only have one priority. And, and so you, you've got to, and with, with my athletes, I'll say, what, what is the goal for this training phase? What is the, the one thing, the non-negotiable, what's the one thing that we're gonna work on? And if it's red pointing, then mm -hmm. everything falls to the wayside to make sure that the red pointing happens. Um, if it's fat loss, I don't care how much stronger you're getting in the bouldering gym. Um, we're gonna work on losing weight. The only, the only metric we're using is how much you fat loss um, we're, we're seeing out of the athlete. And so for your athlete, I would say, you know, what are your non-negotiables? Are you willing to continue climbing at the same level to continue enjoying running? Or are you willing to drop back on the amount of cardiovascular activity you're doing to try out and see if you can get better climbing? And, and that's my main thing is like, let's back off on it for a season. You know, you can quit running for six months and sure. then get your running fitness back in a month. Mm -hmm. So let's try it. Let's, let's see um, if what we're doing isn't working and it's like Dan John says he says what you should aim for in the future is to quit making the same mistakes over and over again as often and it's what we do with our you know when we look at those non-negotiables I always like to bench press I never stretch um, I drink beer every night those sorts of things are gonna hold us back more than how hard we can train in the bouldering gym yeah okay one last one let's look at me I've been mostly, you know, I've, I've been able to do no activity until the last two weeks for the last 12 weeks. So I've never been the type to cut weight. I kind of always hover around between 143 and 147, you know, and when I'm red pointing something hard, I might just watch my sugar intake a little more closely or watch my carb intake a little more closely and then I dropped down to 143. Um, now I'm, I'm at right around 152 or so, so I haven't gained a considerable amount of weight, but I have lost some muscle mass in my arm, shoulder, back because of my surgery. So I know that that weight's come from elsewhere, and I'm definitely getting the, you know, the dad bod thing going on yeah. because I haven't been able to do anything. You know, there was no, running there was yeah. no you know, i couldn't i couldn't do anything basically um you just don't know how much your shoulder does until you can't use the damn thing yeah yeah um so now as i'm being able to do some sort of weight training um some sort of movement am i going to be better off doing you know um high intensity anaerobic activities like squat jumps 
things like that. Should I go running and get some cardio to, you know, build a little engine uh, to, to support my strength training? Uh, even though I have a background in having pretty good cardio fitness? Or do I just go straight back into strength training and, and that's going to help me burn the, the calories I need to? Um, well, I always like to look at, at injuries. I think I have to because it, they're so devastating as opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and Same so here. you can say, mm -hmm. let's, let's develop some of these other things that you can do without, without the shoulder. And so maybe you really can sit, say, I'm going to take two months since I'm so far away from performance climbing. You don't get to start climbing again for another eight weeks. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, then that's, that's starting at the basement. And so probably the next time you're going to be sending hard stuff will be next March or April. Right. Um, and so we're so far out from performance that base fitness is going to be the main thing. Um, keeping the metabolism fired up, um, you know, keeping yourself lean, all those sorts of things. And so I think a combination of those things is right. You know, little bit of running, um, little bit of, of strength training for the legs and the, and the core as, as, um, as tolerated. Um, but, but really keeping that metabolism turned on. And that's what you've seen is you probably continue to eat about the same amount, Yeah. but that's your right. activity levels have dropped More off. cupcakes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, like you're like, what the hell with this? I'm hurt. I'm going <laughs> to eat whatever I can. And so, but we it's see that. And another thing that happens is as you age, your metabolism changes. And we'll yeah. see people that eat the exact same thing. Like I've eaten this my whole life, but now they've got a little bit of flab and then they get a little bit more and adults tend to gain um, uh, just about, it's not too much, but like 0.2% body fat per year. Mm. Um, and unless we start working a little bit harder and use our, our adult discipline and, and our um, desire to continue performing in the sport, we start to see that, you know, you turn into the pear shape. Um, you, you know, you start going to all the, you know, American mm. Alpine Club meetings. And, you know, <laughs> so, you know, you, you're a has been. And so you got to really watch that. Um, and so what we really want to do is, is continue to stay fit and strong yep. in, in whatever regard you can and combine that with your rehab stuff. Um, and so I think um, looking at your three energy systems, um, we want to build, you know, the, your, your a-lactic will be, you know, strength. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your lactic stuff, you could do some, some sprints like um, airdyne style stuff when the arm allows. Yep. Um, you, even if it, if it has to be just leg sprints, it, it's going to, again, we're in that metabolic specific stuff, not motor specific. Um, it's better than not doing it. Um, and then, you know, keeping your legs under you, you know, hikes, um, getting to the crag to belay your friends, um, you know, what, whatever else it is. So as long as we're working all three of those energy systems, you'll, you'll hit the ground running when you can start actually training again. Cool. Well, I appreciate it. I'm going to take your advice. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for sitting down with me again. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. This has been great. Yeah. I, uh, I didn't take Steve's advice. Well, sort of. I guess I sort of did because I did a bunch of kettlebell energy systems work that I think really set me up well for uh, coming back strong from my shoulder surgery. And I'm climbing better now than I ever have. So, so yeah, maybe I sort of did take his advice. Anyway, check out Steve at uh, climbstrong.com. And if you happen to be in Lander, check his gym out. It's Elemental Performance and Fitness. Uh, it's a really great gym, and you'll... Uh, You'll definitely have a good session there. So, um, yeah, if, uh, if you happen to be in the Akron area, check us out for those workshops on the 10th and 11th of May. Nate and I will be there teaching you how to get the most out of your bouldering sessions. Uh, check out our ebooks at powercompanyclimbing.com. You can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on Pinterest. Uh, all the social medias except for the Twitters. We don't tweet. Uh, we don't do that stuff. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you think about those rants. If you, uh, if you want me to drink a little, get a little surly, and, uh, yeah, just rant a little. Let me know if that's something you want to hear. All right, next time. This time, 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 this time